Before I talk about Enlightenment science, I think it's important to note that the development of science in Europe during the Renaissance and then the Enlightenment would probably not have been possible without the contributions made by Muslim scholars. During the period when Europe was suffering what historians have called a dark age in the centuries following the fall of Rome, the embrace of Islam in North Africa and the Middle East and beyond created political stability that encouraged an exchange of ideas and technology. While the medieval monks of Europe were busy copying illuminated Latin Bibles and hymnals, scholars like, and I apologize in advance, I'm going to butcher these Arabic names, but scholars like al Khwarizmi who lived from 780 to 850 and was the inventor of algebra, Al-Kindi, who lived from 801 to 873 and was a philosopher and a musician, Al-Zarawi, 936 to 1013, the father of surgery, Im Al-Haytham, 965 to 1040, a physicist and the father of optics, Al-Biruni, 973 to 1050, a historian and a scientist. Ibsina, 980 to 1037, whose name was Latinized to Avicenna. He was an astronomer and a physician. And E. Rusht, 1126 to 1198, whose name was Latinized to Averroes, but whose actual name lives on in the surname Rushdi. These philosophers and scientists not only preserved classical Greek philosophy and science that had been lost in Europe, but they made important original contributions to knowledge and culture. Arab mathematicians had been so impressed with the Indian number system, which included the concept of zero, that they adopted it. And in the late 1200s, Western Europeans began to change from Roman numerals, which did not have a zero, to Arabic numerals. There would be no computers without this revolutionary change in mathematics. Try dividing using Roman numerals. Arab scholars helped to trigger the Renaissance, which led to both the European Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution that produced the modern world that we live in today. In most of their kingdoms and caliphates, Muslim rulers respected the Jews and the Christians as what they called people of the book. This was especially important in the Iberian Peninsula, present-day Portugal and Spain, most of which was dominated by Muslim rulers from 711 to 1492. The introduction of ideas in astronomy and navigation and mathematics in Iberia soon spread to other parts of Europe. In 1492, Christopher Columbus was able to sail to the New World, partly because of Arab naval and navigation technologies. Now, following on these Muslim scientists and philosophers, the European philosophers and scientists who led the Enlightenment were dominated by Isaac Newton, who lived from 1643 to 1727. He's the co-inventor of calculus and the inventor of the first unified theory of nature. Newton's Principia Mathematica, first published in 1687, created a foundation for all the physics and engineering that followed it. And his theories were basically undisputed until Einstein and quantum physics took up the challenge of describing the universe at the macroscopic and the microscopic levels in the early 20th century. Other important Enlightenment thinkers included Emily du Châtelet, a French aristocrat who studied and translated both Newton and his chief rival, the German mathematician Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz. Leibniz was the other inventor of calculus. And actually the version that we now use is based a little bit more on his notation system of integrals than on Newton's. The scholars and their colleagues described the field that they were working in as natural science or natural philosophy. And they tried to find natural laws for society and politics and the economy to parallel Newton's discoveries in gravity and optics. John Locke, Adam Smith, and Voltaire formulated ideas about natural rights and society that epitomized what English speakers call the Enlightenment and what Germans, following the philosopher Immanuel Kant, called Aufklärung. 
which literally means the clearing up of something, as if you were polishing a glass so you could see more clearly through it. Kant famously explained that his Aufklärung was humanity's emergence from its self-imposed adolescence. One of the consequences of Newton's physics and these other Enlightenment ideas was a continuing crisis in religion. Although Newton himself seems to have believed in a god of some type, the universe that he described in his theories did not require a personal deity to be actively engaged in making things happen. Newton's universe seemed to be more like one of these new mechanical clocks that were just becoming popular. These complex machines might require a mechanical engineer or a watchmaker to design and build them, but once they had been made and wound, they could pretty much be left to themselves. And so absorbing this watchmaker metaphor, many Enlightenment thinkers began to reject the popular religious vision of an activist god who was involved in the day-to-day -day operation of the world and who rewarded the righteous and punished the sinners, or who chose sides in history and in wars. And then the Protestant idea of predestination suggested that there wasn't even any free will, and that from God's perspective, time and chance didn't really even exist. Newton and other European scientists challenged that notion. Many also began to doubt traditional stories of the deity's interference in history including the Christian story of Jesus. For example, the Scottish philosopher David Hume wrote an essay on miracles in 1748 that was widely influential and is still a required text for philosophy students. Hume didn't argue that miracles couldn't happen, but he said that people who believed in miracles were usually not talking about events that they had witnessed themselves but only retelling stories of miracles that they had heard or read about for existence in the Christian Bible. For Hume, the issue that divided religious believers from skeptics was not actually miracles, but testimony about miracles that were reported to have happened years, decades, centuries, in his day, 1748 years ago. In contrast, Hume argued, laws of nature could be deduced right now because they continued to operate right now and their effects could be seen every day. Hume left this essay out of the first edition of his book, An Enquiry into Human Understanding, to avoid antagonizing the faithful. But it did find its way into print and it remains an important challenge to traditions that seek to assert their authority based on supernatural claims. So some questions about that. First, how did Muslim scholars contribute to building the modern world? Secondly, do you think the term enlightenment or Aufklärung is an accurate description of the change in our understanding of the world that was produced by this new natural philosophy? And finally, were philosophers such as David Hume justified in suggesting that supernatural claims are problematic.